We're going to talk a little bit now about biological traits and addiction. So let's first go over what might be considered a biological trait. So to be considered biological, traits must be reliable. So differences between individuals should persist over time and over non-drastic situational changes. So if you looked at the BISBAS model, for example, there were some clear distinctive traits that were different between people who are high in BIS and people who are high in BAS. Well, those have to persist over time and they should be consistent. They should be genetic. So the similarity of related persons on the psychological trait should depend on their similarity on the biological trait. So there should be a linkage between what they've inherited biologically and what they experience or demonstrate psychologically. It should be animal consistent. So the correlate of the biological trait in animal behavior should parallel similar correlates in the human behavior. So if in animals, a certain um, physiological or biological characteristic causes them to be withdrawn, and in humans, that, that biological characteristic seems to cause them to be outgoing, there's probably something amiss there, and that wouldn't make sense, and we wouldn't probably consider it a biological trait. And it should be human consistent. If there are differences according to age or sex, then the same differences should be seen in the psychological trait. So, um, so if the physical, if the biological trait is different, then we should see the same differences in the psychological trait. So we often think of then looking at the relationship between these traits and the behaviors as being mediated. So because we're going to be talking about this model a lot, I'll just give you an example of what this is. So we might hypothesize that, say, um, the hormone testosterone leads to aggression. But sometimes there's something in the middle of that that's actually causing the relationship. Um, and actually, let me give you a different example. We might consider that um, being in an aggressive situation, like being at a, a concert where everyone's thumping their chest and being, being really aggressive, going in this mosh pit or something, that that would lead to, the tra to behavior, aggressive behavior. But what might be coming in the middle of that is actually testosterone, possibly. Um, and so it might not be, in essence, that the, this situation is leading to this aggressive behavior, but rather the situation is causing an increase in testosterone, which in turn leads to the behavior. And the mediator is that factor that pops in the middle there. So mediated effects, a couple examples. Um, Matt is a hatter. Hat makers suffered brain damage when exposed to mercury in hat making factories. So the independent variable is hat making. The dependent variable, these people might drool, talk to themselves, become paranoid, depressed, hallucinate. But it's not that hat making causes all of these symbols, it's that hat making led to an increase in mercury, which caused all these signals. We might have another example with lead poisoning and cognitive deficits in children. So we might say living in Detroit leads to these attentional problems in children, but it might be not a consequence of living in Detroit, but a consequence of living in Detroit having lead in the water, and then that lead in turn causing these behavioral characteristics. So in that case, lead would be the mediator. And this is the example I have right here. The independent variable is lead, intellectual and behavioral impairments that last a lifetime, and it accumulates in all the cells, and so that impedes normal co connectivity. And this is an example of that water situation that happened because of the change in pipes in Flint, Michigan. Um, other examples. You might think older people are forgetful and irritable, and maybe you think older people, because as people get old, they just are forgetful, but in fact, what's happening is maybe a condition like Alzheimer's or dementia, which is responsible for the forgetfulness rather than the age itself. And this example, we've already done the hat makers. 
becoming mad, well, you might say, oh, don't get, become a hat maker because you'll get crazy. But in fact, it's the mercury that they worked with to make the hats that contributed to the madness. So now let's move on to addiction. Um, I don't know. Um, addiction can come in a lot of different things. Of course, we often think of drug addiction, but what do you think about video game addiction? What about food addiction? What about like addiction to a TV show or addiction to a physical activity? So we have had some revisions of our definition of addiction from the DSM-4 to the DSM-5. So here in the DSM-5, we include this craving or a strong desire to use. And so not just limited to sort of legal problems and that sort of thing, but the craving, that deep, deep desire. The behavioral definition, what would we be looking for? We'd be looking for excessive repetitive use of pleasurable activities to cope with unmanageable internal conflict, pressure, and stress. So note that it is coming from internal tension or stress, and that leads a person to want to compensate with these pleasurable activities. Whatever it is a person is addicted to, bullet point two, may begin pleasurably. It might serve that pleasure purpose and divert from those internal stress, but it needs more activity to achieve the same effect. So this person, it starts out as a good thing, but then they find they have to have more and more to keep having it serve that pleasure purpose. It results in injury to a person's health or to his work, family, and social relationships. The person would deny that the activity is detrimentally affecting him, so he's blind or in denial to the effects, and may suffer physical or psychological withdrawal pains if he or she stops the activity, and so they might go back and resume that excessive pattern. So we can think about addiction a little more loosely than we had earlier. Um, so um, now we'll look at some of the mediators. So we know that people who are high in BAS and low in BIS are more susceptible to addiction. What's actually going on? Whoops. Um, we know that people who are high in BAS and low in BIS have high reward seeking and low caution. So it is this personality trait and these associated behaviors that make them more susceptible to addiction. Um, it's not an automatic pathway. And a sensation seeking personality, it's much the same effect. Um, the sensation seeker might really have, be high in that disinhibition trait. They might go to that party, desire more stimulation, more drugs, more, and that could in turn lead to the addiction. So we do find that high BAS, low BIS profiles and sens high sensation seekers are more susceptible to addiction. So it works like this to give it to play it out a little more. Let's say you're a high sensation seeker, and let's say you seek out these wild parties, and let's say you maybe also seek out um, the experience seeking, so you take drugs. And the dopamine that comes along with many drugs makes a person feel better, so you take drugs again to get more dopamine. In time, the brain senses these abnormal levels of dopamine and decreases the dopamine receptors that it has so now your brain has changed and you can no longer receive pleasure from doing regular things. So now you become tense, unhappy, you experience no pleasure at all because your dopamine receptors have decreased. And so you keep seeking more drugs to compensate. So the brain adapts, more drugs, brain adapts, more drugs, addiction. So it's kind of a, a catch-22 there. You can't get past it easily and it's gonna be a dark period before it gets better. Um, we also have legal and illegal drugs, so prescription drugs, tranquilizers like, val like Valium, sleeping pills, various antidepressants um, can have short-term and sometimes long-term effects on personality, so they can change the way your brain functions. Cocaine tends to produce, it's a direct pathway to, it, cocaine is a direct pathway to your dopamine system, and so they tend to use too much, produce symptoms of paranoia um, or like obsessiveness or feelings of persecution because dopamine empowers motivation and it inhibits stop. Um, if you have too little dopamines, you're getting Parkinson's and you won't be able to move. Um, so personality is linked to these outcomes. So personality 
type might feel lethargic and dull, but might, what might really be going on is that they're taking tranquilizers and that's leading to that. Personality C might feel paranoid obsessed, but in fact, it's the cocaine that's leading to it. So it's not exactly a personality type. There's also some evidence about drug of choice. Um, people tend to choose different drugs that give them pleasure. And we don't have a lot of information on this. Like you might know someone who prefers to have a stimulant. If they're gonna use drugs, that's what they're gonna prefer. And others who might prefer like alcohol or something. And the studies are weak and they tend to use, and studies that are exploring this tend to use people who are already being treated. So what's the problem with this? Well, there's a reciprocal relationship between drugs used and preference formation of traits. So that means that, <clears throat> excuse me, that means that the drugs could cause the trait or the traits could cause the drug and probably it works in both directions. So as a person makes a choice about a drug that they're using, then that drug changes them. And so if they had made a different choice, then they might have been changed in a different way. We might define drug of choice as a drug you have the most difficulty not using. So that might be a different way to think about it for people who are abusing many drugs. What's the hardest one for a person to avoid? Um, and unfortunately, we have poorly implemented studies, excuse me, looking at MBTI data and drug of choice. So we don't have a lot of studies on this. And you'll recall the MBTI is this Myers-Briggs. So they're just relating these Myers-Briggs types to drug of choice. So there's not a lot. I think this is sort of an interesting question, actually. Um, and um, we might want to do crowdsourced data. This might be a way that we'd want to study this in the future. Now, um, the addiction scale is kind of interesting. This is a scale that attempts to predict who's likely to become addicted. So we know that certain traits are linked to addiction, but we don't know, um, but this is more looking at the characteristics that a person has in general, including their situation, that might lead them to become more susceptible to addiction. Um, so it's, it's geared for identifying kids in school who might be prone to addiction with the idea that then we could engage in preventive behaviors. Um, and you'll see that if you look at this scale, it starts with, have you had very strange or peculiar experiences? These are questions that they were found were people who become addicted would tend to answer in the same way. Have you often gone against your parents' wishes? So teens who become addicted tend to answer yes, you know, a higher, higher agreement with this. Are you a steady person? This asterisk means that this is actually a reverse question. So people who become addicted tend to score low on this. Do you wish you could have more respect for yourself? People who are susceptible to addiction score high. Have you ever been in trouble with the law? Again, this is a this is a characteristic, a situational characteristic that predicts addiction. Do you prefer rock music over ballads? Have your parents often objected to the kind of people you went around with? Here's another reverse question, number eight. Have you lived the right kind of life? People who are susceptible to addiction tend to respond low on this or negatively. Have people said that you sometimes act too rashly? This question gets at that impulsivity that people who are addictive tend to have. Do you prefer loud music over quiet music? Here again is this need for stimulation. Are you unable to keep your mind on one thing? Here is maybe an aspect of sensation seeking that is this boredom susceptibility. Do you go to church almost every week? Um, this is an important question. People who are susceptible to addiction tend not to have these spiritual practices and it can get at the importance of say these rituals or uh, an investment in some sort of a spiritual life that can prevent, prevent or limit the likelihood of addiction. Do you prefer sports cars over passenger cars? Here's again, need for stimulation. Do you often feel fed up? There's sort of a burgeoning frustration. 
Do you have strange or peculiar thoughts? These might create stress and lead to addiction to kind of quell it. Would you prefer to be a stunt man woman over a prop man or woman, someone who's doing the stunts instead of preparing for the stunts? Do you prefer endurance sports over games with rests? Do you ever feel that strangers were looking at you critically? People who have these strange thoughts, strange experiences, a little bit of paranoia might be quelling these negative emotions with drugs. Do you play hooky from school quite often as a youngster? Skip out of school? Do you prefer electric music over unamplified music? And finally, do you give money to charities as a reverse item? So this is the scale that predicts people who are more likely to become addicted. Well, if we think about this, let's say we did decide to give this to many different people, that would be sort of a tricky situation, wouldn't it? Because what would we do with that information? Like, would it help you to know that you are more likely to become addicted? Or would you become addicted and say, well, yeah, but I was prone to it. And I know, I know uh, people who have talked to their kids, like if addiction is in their family, they talk to their kids and tell them and give the message that they need to be more careful than their friends. So it, it can go two ways. Um, so addictive personality then is this idea we're looking at and what are some associated traits? Well, impulsive behavior, um, so they aren't good at waiting for a reward, and maybe an antisocial personality like break, violating the law or playing hooky and a disposition towards sensation seeking. Impulsive behavior, as you'll see in an article that you were asked to read, can is measured by this what's called the go-no-go -no -go task, and I've put a link up in case you want to try out that task um, and see how how good you are at at withholding an impulse. People who have an addictive personality tend to have a high value on non-conformity, so they don't want to do what other people are, and a weak commitment to the goals for achievement valued by the society, so they're not committed to society's goals or to community. A sense of social alienation, they don't feel they're a part of their group. And a general tolerance for deviance, they tolerate people who are breaking the rules. A sense of heightened stress, this may help why adult, explain why adolescence and other stressful transition periods are often associated with the onset of drug and alcohol problems, like onset of adolescence is a stressful period of big change or maybe just going to college, leaving home, a period of big change, or maybe um, getting a divorce, a big change. Those are periods at which someone is vulnerable because stress is higher. And people who have sexual, who have been sexually or physically abused, um, that's, a, that's a particular challenge because the parent expectations for those people are so mixed. Um, it's hard for them to meet those expectations, which might also lead people like this to withdraw. So there are some traits that make a person vulnerable. When we take this addiction scale, we find that people in the younger age group tend to have much higher scores. And so lower scores as people get older. Um, and we know that males tend to have higher scores than females, possibly because of that need for sensation seeking, that males tend to be higher in general. And the question, would it be useful to give this scale to all adolescents with the idea that we could engage them in preventive behaviors? And this is a debatable question that might make a good topic if we were in a live class. So to conclude, traits like sensation seeking and high BAS predict addiction, but they're mediated by behaviors. Behaviors are measured by scales and can predict addiction based on social norms. More studies are needed on drug preferences and personality.